My name is Christian Osterman, Director of the History and Public Policy Program here at the Wilson Center, and I'd like to welcome you uh, to the Center. Um, let me just uh, say a couple of words of introduction since this event will be webcast live. The Wilson Center is, of course, the official U.S. memorial to President Woodrow Wilson, the 28th President of the United States, uh, as both a distinguished scholar, the only American president with a PhD, and a national leader, Wilson felt strongly that the scholar and the policymaker were engaged in a common enterprise. Here at the center, we commemorate the ideals and concerns of Woodrow Wilson by providing a link between the world of ideas and the world of policy, fostering research, study, discussion, and collaboration among a full spectrum of individuals concerned with policy and scholarship in national and world affairs, directed by Congressman Lee Hamilton, who is busy these days co-chairing the Iraq Study Group. The center hosts about 150 scholars each year and about uh, 400, over 400 meetings on international and national affairs. The center's history and public policy program seeks to provide historical context to current public policy issues and a forum for the discussion of new significant policy relevant historical findings and publications, such as Chris Tudor's uh, new book, The Truth is Our Weapon, uh, which we will talk about today here in the heart of the nation's capital. Many of you are familiar with one of our core activities, the Cold War International History Project, uh, which for the last decade and a half has spearheaded a global effort to unlock, translate, and disseminate new documents and perspectives on the international history of the Cold War, in particular from previously inaccessible archives in the former communist world and increasingly beyond that. We publish a Cold War Project Bulletin occasionally. The current next issue with a heavy focus on China is in, in the works right now. Um, uh, in the meantime, a lot of our materials go up on the website. Um, if you, the easiest way to find our website is if you Google Cold War International History Project, it should take you to cwihp.org, our website or you can also, of course, get to it through the Wilson Center website. If you're interested in further information on the project, feel free to pick up a brochure outside. Before I introduce our speaker today, uh, let me just uh, uh, do two more, uh, uh, say two more things. Thanks, um, of course, uh, to my uh, team, Mircea Montiano and Ryan Gage, who are sitting in the back, who um, help putting um, these events together. And let me point you to uh, our next Cold War Project seminar on November 28th. We'll have uh, Jamil Hassan Lee here presenting his new book, At the Dawn of the Cold War, um, which, is, uh, which really deals with um, uh, Azerbaijan and Iran and the first um, uh, one of the first Cold War crises. Malcolm Byrne, Director of Research at the National Security Archive, will be commenting on the book. Jamil is not uh, uh, just a um, historian, he's also a member of parliament of the Republic of Azerbaijan and uh, we're very fortunate that he'll be joining us. That's Tuesday, November 28th from 4 to 6, um, from 4 to 6 or actually Four to five thirty, I think. Um, please join us for that. Um, with that, let me um, let me uh, introduce our guest today. We're very delighted uh, to have one of our State Department colleagues here, um, Chris Tudor. He's a historian in the Declassification and Public Publishing Division of the Office of the Historian at the State Department where he coordinates the declassification of manuscripts for the Foreign Relations of the United States series, an essential source um, for all international historians. He is also responsible for producing the office's internet-only publications and has been a member of the organizing committee for the, office for two, for the office's two scholarly conferences, one on the um, 67 Arab-Israeli War held in 2004 and one held last year 
on the 1971 South Asia crisis. He chaired a panel at the office's uh, September 2006 conference, Transforming the Cold War, the U.S. and China, 69 to 80. He earned his B.A. at the University of Vermont in 87 and a Ph.D. from American University in 2002. He is, of course, the author of The Truth is Our Weapon, the Rhetorical Diplomacy of Dwight D. Eisenhower and John Foster Dallas, uh, which he will be talking about today and which was published um, this year. In June 2006, he was named to the advisory board of the Voices of Democracy Project, a web-based teaching program for American undergraduates that promotes the study of great speeches and debates sponsored by the National Endowment for the Humanities. His article, Reenacting the Story of Tantalus, uh, Eisenhower, Dallas, and the Failure of Rhetoric of Liberation, was published in the fall of 2005 edition of the Journal of Cold War Studies. Another article, A Messiah That Will Never Come, British Reconcilia Reconciliation Efforts, American Independence and Revolutionary War Diplomacy is under consideration at Diplomatic History. He is currently working on a reassessment of American revolutionary diplomacy and a history of Nixon's opening to China. So an ambitious research agenda, besides, I'm sure, a full-time job at the State Department. Chris, it's uh, wonderful to have you here. Congratulations on your book. And we look forward to, um, uh, uh, to your presentation. We'll, Chris will talk for about 25 minutes or so. And then we'll, um, should have about uh, half an hour or more, if we like, for question and, uh, questions and comments. Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christian. And first of all, I want to, to thank everyone for coming. This is really a nice turnout. I appreciate it. Um, and also to say, uh, not only am I happy to be here um, at the Wilson Center, but also to acknowledge that um, this book, my dissertation, and the article that I wrote that was published would not have been anywhere near um, what it has what, it, what it has become without this uh, the Cold War International History Project. I mean, the the documents they publish, the bulletins that they publish, um, the website is incredible. And I wanted to say again and acknowledge that and thank you very much because uh, it certainly made my research a lot easier. And uh, I can't tell you how many people have said that over the years. I appreciate that and I'm honored to be here at the Wilson Center. Uh, John Foster Dulles, of course, his uh, uncle was uh, Robert Lansing, who was uh, Wilson's Secretary of State. So he had. Uh, and uh, Dulles had participated in the Versailles Conference. He had uh, worked on the reparations problem with Germany. So it's uh, really a, a sort of apropos that it's here. So again, thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm, I apologize for um, not having any copies of the book or any flyers available. We had a little trouble, I guess, with um, LSU in getting, getting some stuff sent up here. So uh, hopefully we'll have some links available to their website or um, if you are interested in ordering the book, it's on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and some of the other websites. So, and I appreciate it again, once again, for, for everyone coming to this uh, talk. Um, the other day I was talking to my mom, and she asked me, um, before she tried to read it, she said, uh, what's the book about? Mm -hmm. Sum it up in a couple of words. And I, and I thought about it for a minute, and I thought, you know, I, I said, uh, basically it comes down to, um, if you mean something, do it. If you don't, shut up. And I think that's what uh, the lesson that I drew from this, from all the research I've done. I started this, um, what became Chapter 4 and the, the article, the Tantalus article, actually was a research paper I did when I was an undergrad at the University of Vermont. And as I was looking at liberation policy in Hungary, um, at the time I was, you know, 18, 19 years old, and it didn't occur to me in a larger sense, I couldn't figure out why there was such a, um, a gap between Eisenhower's and Dulles's rhetoric and what they actually did. And it really focused on Hungary. And why did he, why did the, uh, why did uh, Eisenhower and Dulles consider liberation to be such an important policy goal? And yet when it came time to act in 1953 in Germany uh, during the rebellion and also in 1956, especially in Hungary, why didn't they do anything? And I thought, okay, this is very strange. Um, and that piqued my interest. So when I got to grad school at, the, at American University, that was my first seminar paper, a much longer discussion of this particular topic. And as I went through and searching for a dissertation topic, it occurred to me that 
this particular theme of a gap between um, what I ended up calling rhetorical diplomacy and uh, which was their which was Eisenhower <coughs> Dulles's public uh, posture and their uh, secret confidential decision to be much more uh, if you can call the term pragmatic or much less belligerent um, it became a recurring theme at least as as far as what I found um, in uh, their European policy um, as I said in my in my introduction to my book I think this is it's very possible that this is um, how they approached uh, their policy towards Asia, the Asian uh, region. Um, in a discussion I just had with one of my colleagues, I'm not sure if that extended to, say, Latin America or, or uh, nations of the third world, other areas of the third world. But when I started looking through um, their European policy, this continued to come up. And I thought to myself, why? Why is this happening? And during my uh, uh, graduate days, I, start, I focused in on their, um, on Eisenhower and Dulles's administra the administration. And after I finished um, the chapter on liberation, I did a chapter on the Berlin crisis, which became the last uh, chapter and the third uh, focus of my third uh, case study in this book. And that was a, uh, an examination of the question of whether Germany should be reunified. This was during the Eisenhower administration. And what I found was that um, it was wrapped up, excuse me, it was wrapped up in the idea of recognizing the Eastern German government or what, um, what they can considered functionaries of the Eastern Ger German government um, who were attempting to um, establish tariffs and tolls and inspection, uh, an inspection reg regimen on American and British and French forces in Berlin, in the Berlin Corridor. So that became the second case study because I found, again, this gap between uh, uh, Eisenhower's public rhetoric of reunifying Germany um, versus its confidential decision to essentially defer to not only the Soviet Union, which wanted a divided Germany, but also the British and the French and the other European allies. Um, what I continued to find was um, this enormous uh, this gap between what uh, what they wanted to do publicly and their consistent confidential decision making to not rattle the Soviets to not perhaps tip the fragile you know time period to ha perhaps cause an accidental nuclear war. They also did not want to alienate their allies. The NATO alliance was very fragile at this point. But the temptation from both Eisenhower and Dulles was to sort of ride herd on the allies in both um, during, uh, in, under liberation policy, so also uh, German policy. So I thought, okay, that's two, all right, but that's not enough. Is there, is there another, is there another uh, case? And the third case I discovered was uh, the European defense community. The same thing happened. Uh, Eisenhower and Dell, both Eisenhower and Dulles believed that the European defense community, which was a, a supranational army, which would consist of not only the continental European uh, armies, but also West Germany, West Germany's armed forces. They considered that the crucial linchpin to um, an effective Western European defense. And so they determined that they must push the Allies, especially the French, to accept the European defense community. Now, the interesting thing is the EDC was actually proposed by a Frenchman, um, Schumann, in 1950-51. The problem was he was in the minority in, in France. France, Belgium, some of the other countries, even though they were willing to sign off, were scared to death of a revived Germany, um, which you know made sense. Eisenhower and Dulles believed this, and they understood. They understood the fear of the Europeans toward a revived Germany constantly throughout their confidential deliberations, national security policy meetings, telephone calls, whatever. They realized that they couldn't push the Europeans too hard. And yet, publicly, Dulles threatened uh, what he called an agonizing reappraisal of American policy. Um, Eisenhower, you, uh, you're all probably familiar with the term um, bigger bang for the buck. 
the whole desire by Eisenhower to cut the government and balance the budget. And he determined that, you know, the European defense community would be a great way for the United States to reduce its defense commitments. So, confidentially, he said, you know, okay, we understand the fears of the Europeans, but publicly, both Eisenhower and Dulles were, were saying to the Europeans, you know, if you don't pass this, if you don't ratify this treaty, we're going to essentially not only cut our defense budgets, but we're going to pull out of Europe. So what I found in these three particular case studies was there was this contradiction between their public policy and what they, what they considered to be a more pragmatic and confidential policy. So as I was doing this, I was trying to figure out where it all came from. I had, you know, some pretty good evidence um, during the, in, within these three particular papers that I wrote as a, as a graduate student. And I thought to myself, where did it all come from? What, this cannot be coming out of some, you know, blank slate. And what I found was when I started looking uh, back, uh, going back all the way to the Versailles Conference, the 1920s, and looking at uh, Dulles's papers, his speeches, um, and also looking at Eisenhower and um, some of the some of the uh, conversations he'd had during the the, the 30s and, and late 30s before World War II was a pretty consistent uh, idea on the part of both men that uh, World War, you know, had to be avoided. How could that be done? And the, the fear of both, of both Eisenhower and Dulles was that the United States would return to the pre-World War II era of, of what FDR called um, isolationism, um, or what I decided, I, I, I thought a better term was nationalism. One of the things, one of the challenges of this of this project was trying to define all the terms, and because um, pretty much all the evidence that I read from secondary sources and and also primary sources was that isolationist was really a pejorative term that FDR used against his uh, opponents in the Republican Party, men like uh, Robert Taft, and until Pearl Harbor, Arthur Vandenberg, and it was a way to sort of whip up. Um, I guess what we would uh, term now, uh, you know, excite the base in the Democrat Party for those who were more internationalist, or what I've called um, nationalist globalism. I borrowed from a number of other historians. But the real fear of these two men was that the United States would return to those days when it would refuse to get involved in the world. World War II and also World War I, the lesson of both these wars, the failure of the League of Nations, um, the American, um, the United States' refusal to ratify the treaty, and also in the 30s, the, uh, the Europeans' refusal or, or inability to enforce the League of Nations. Um, those, those mistakes could not be repeated. And in fact, throughout um, both uh, Dulles and Eisenhower's um, private and public careers, you see the same things coming up. Um, fear of uh, an American retreat, and um, isolationism. There was an enormous battle within the Republican Party um, over Eisenhower, between Eisenhower and Taft after, um, after Truman's second term, or during Truman's second term, the 1952 primaries. A huge battle over where the United States should go. I, I think it's important for us to remember that in 1952, internationalism or nationalist globalism was certainly not um, the strong um, and uh, unified posture of, of American politics. I mean, there was a lot of dissension, especially within the Republican Party, uh, to stay out of European affairs. I mean, it goes all the way back to, you know, the lessons of the 1790s and George Washington's farewell address. The United States should not get involved only unless its national interests were directly threatened. So Eisenhower and Dulles, Dulles throughout his, the 20 years before he became uh, Secretary, 25, 30 years before he became Secretary of State, and Eisenhower as well, constantly warned that the United States could not retreat from the world, could not withdraw. It must stay focused on international affairs. And so that was almost the last bridge. I, I found everything from Dulles 
made sense to me. Um, his writings, voluminous writings throughout the years, his commitment to bipartisan partisanship during the 40s, during World War II and afterwards in 1948. He worked very closely with Truman um, and Atchison on uh, the Japanese Peace Treaty. He was a member of uh, the uh, official delegation to the Conference of Foreign Ministers that took place in the, the late 40s at the, the very beginning of the Cold War. But where was Eisenhower in all this? Eisenhower was a very, you know, we all know he was the, the brilliant general who planned D-Day. Uh, before that, he was responsible for the supplying of the, the war effort. Um, but he was a pretty low-key, uh, not a very, certainly nowhere near as famous or infamous as, as his fellow generals like Patton or, uh, or, or MacArthur. And I thought to myself, okay, what is there that's missing here? I know there has to be something. And the thing that triggered uh, and made this whole, I think, made this whole book possible, uh, I was reading um, uh, Jim Hirschberg's biography of uh, James B. Conant. And Conant talked about, I mean, excuse me, Hirschberg discussed um, Conant and Eisenhower's um, in the, in the Eisenhower and, and, and Conant's uh, membership in something called the Educational Policy Commission of the National Education Association. And all of a sudden, a light went on in my head. And what I realized was that when I went through the records, um, what Hirschberg concentrated on was the anti-communism and the, the sort of McCarthyite roots of that particular commission. What I found was exactly the opposite. To me, um, this was the key to Eisenhower's, uh, at least public rhetoric, that he ended up um, adopting in the 50s when he was president. Eisenhower believed that the United States had a, had a uh, responsibility and um, to educate the public to the dangers of communism. Indeed, um, the interesting thing was that both Eisenhower and Conant on that commission were opposed to the loyalty oaths that were being thrown around by a lot of people in the late 40s during, a, during the late Maca uh, first Truman administration, excuse me, first and second Truman administrations, even before MacArthur. McCarthy, excuse me, became so prominent. And I found that very interesting, and I thought, interesting, here it comes. It was a very positive um, international outlook. In fact, um, to me, it was also um, the first example that I saw of Eisenhower adopting what we have later be um, talked about as cultural diplomacy. And in fact, in 1947, Eisenhower testified in front of the House of Representatives in support of the smith munt Act. And what he wanted to do, essentially, was um, he basically said, if we don't engage in propaganda, if we don't match this new worldwide threat of communism, we're going to lose. He said, we're not going to go out and fight the Soviet Union. That would be crazy. But, and one of his quotes was, he said, words are effective weapons of war. This was in 1947, five years before he even decided to run as president. And what I found is looking through all the uh, publications of the European, I mean, of the uh, Educational Policy Commission, was an enormous um, uh, dedication to uh, cultural, um, I'm trying to think of the right word, but um, essentially what it was was, um, you know, international relations on a people to people basis. The smith munt Act um, proposed and eventually was passed, proposed um, cultural exchange programs, enormous information um, directives and uh, programs. And Eisenhower, and when I, when I, once I read these documents, these publicly available documents that, that were published and were distributed all over the country to high schools, grammar, especially high schools, but also um, you know, probably starting in the sixth grade, but also to community colleges throughout the country. I saw that Dulles's writings of the 20s and 30s and 40s were also about educating the public. In fact, Dulles had spent a lot of time breaking down Stalin's works, Lenin's works, and trying to let people know about the threat of communism, of communist internationalism. <coughs> And both of them, both Eisenhower and Dulles, before they took office, 
essentially said an uneducated public would lose the war, the Cold War, by default because the temptations of, of returning to the pre-1940 era uh, were so strong. Uh, the Allies needed to be girded for this long-term struggle, and those were very, very crucial components of their strategy. So when I finally went back and found all this, I sort of started um, what became the first two chapters were the, actually the ones I did the last after all the case studies, and it fit, I hope. At least to me, I think it fit. Um, what happened was that what I was finding was that uh, this drive and desire to educate the public was so ingrained in Eisenhower and Dulles's policy that it overrode the more practical considerations of their secret policy. In other words, um, rhetoric, the rhetoric that they use, whether it's for liberation or the European defense community or uh, the reunification of Germany, uh, really um, implied immediacy. It implied a willingness to act. In fact, both men used, um, described liberation policy as a dynamic, active alternative to what they considered to be the complacency of containment. Um, during the 1952 campaign, after Eisenhower uh, beat Dulles, I mean beat Taft, he went after Truman. Both of them went after Truman and said, containment is simply not enough. The United States must use rhetoric, must use propaganda um, and other uh, acts, weapons, you know, weapons short of war to fight this Cold War, this new struggle, especially in the era of nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, what I discovered as I went through all these, as I came back to the case studies, was uh, these were contradictory and mutually exclusive policies. Um, it's all well and good to to sort of threaten, you know, the <coughs> excuse me, the carrot and the stick with the with the allies, but if you need the allies to help you, you can't push them too far. And I found throughout the decade, throughout the the documents. Um, that there was a realization that rhetoric wasn't working. Rhetoric was backfiring constantly. In fact, I have a great a quote that I found um, from Eisenhower to Dulles in um, November of 1957. He sent a, just a little private note to, to Dulles and he said, our public relations problem almost defies solution. The need always for concerting our views with those of our principal allies the seductive quality of Soviet promise, promises and pronouncements in spite of their unreliability, the propaganda disadvantage under which we operate, all serve to make us appear before the world as something less than persuasive in proclaiming our peaceful purposes. And this, even though this was written in 1957, you could see this throughout, um, even in some of, the, some of Eisenhower's diary uh, entries in the 40s and 50s, this realization that we don't want another world war, uh, we can't fight the Soviets, um, we need to back off. However, we also need an informed and educated public. How do we balance the two? And there was an enormous tension between, we, between both goals. And so, as I said in my opening, um, they discovered that words mattered. Um, with the European defense community, uh, trying to get the French to sign off on the EDC meant essentially acquiescing in France's demands for uh, more money and more aid and more supplies to fight into the uh, communists and into China. The, France, the French were brilliant at, at, at using uh, the, the administration's words against them. You know, essentially the French said, okay, you keep saying that communism is a, is a mortal threat to the whole world. Well, we're fighting it here in into China. Help us. You know, we don't think that the European defense community is as important as fighting communism. And indeed, what I found was there were a number of uh, comments that both uh, Eisenhower and Dulles said, you know, essentially looking at Indochina as the most important foreign policy problem the administration faced. I was really surprised when I saw that. I thought, this is, this is kind of crazy. I mean, they're always talking about Germany and Europe. 
But it was early in 51 that Eisenhower enunciated what became known as the domino theory. If we don't stop the communists in, in South Vietnam or into China, they're going to move to Malaysia, Thailand, Burma, and by extension, Japan, possibly even Japan, South Korea, the entire area. Well, the French used that against the Americans, even though at one point Eisenhower said there, there was no way that a war could be won in that kind of theater. That was almost a direct quote from Eisenhower. And yet, the public policy of educating the public and maintaining anti-communism trumped that basic realization of a man who was, you know, after all, a military expert, a hero, a general, that even though the United States could not win a war, it needed to, to step in. Now, the popular and um, in, in the historical, term, you know, in the historical community, a lot of people have praised Eisenhower for staying out of Vietnam. And indeed, we did not have troops there until, you know, 19, what, 61, 62, depending upon how you look at it. Um, but the seeds of, of the Vietnam intervention, to me, uh, show up between 52 and 54. Um, and in the, this case study that I looked at, um, the idea of balancing a commitment to collective security with anti-communism, um, it was almost impossible. And so the French, in 1954, in the summer of 54, they defeated the treaty in, in the, in the uh, National Assembly. And it was a failure, a failure on the part of the Eisenhower administration. The interesting thing, too, that I also discovered is in, in looking through the, the records is that there were a number of dissenters within the administration who were warning the president and the secretary that its rhetoric wasn't working and it was backfiring. And yet they still, they, they acknowledged this secretly and privately in, in conversations and in meetings, but continued to barrel on in public. And that was another thing that continued throughout in the second case study under liberation policy. And the United States had three opportunities. There was a Czech, there was a, uh, a minor rebellion in, in, the, in Czechoslovakia in June of uh, 1953, followed, of course, a couple weeks later by the East German Workers' Rebellion. Subsequent um, releases by the CIA in the late 90s determined that the United States was, was, was uh, you know, under uh, using Radio Free Europe and uh, RIAS, which is the radio in, Ameri in the American sector in Berlin, was, um, you know, putting out feelers about, you know, possible, you know, rebellion. You know, they were, they were willing to engage in propaganda. Uh, of course, the 1956 Hungar Hungary uh, rebellion, the same thing happened. A lot of uh, post-mortems afterwards determined that the United States was allowing um, its, its uh, Voice of America, RFE, and RIAS people were allowing emigres to write the scripts and some of the emigres seemed to hint that the U.S. was willing to, to militarily support liberation policy. Now, I never found any public willingness on the part of the administration to do that. They certainly, though, implied it. Even though constantly, for the four years up to the, to, to the rebellion, you know, I mean, just with, um, said, no way, we're not going to invade and help any country leave the Soviet Union, Soviet Empire. It's impossible, it's military, unfeasible. We can't do anything about it, and it would lead to a bloodbath. It would kill too many of the, uh, the Hungarians, the Czechs, the Slovaks, whoever. But they couldn't resist this idea of speaking publicly. And so the interesting thing was, <laughs> one of the most amazing quotes that I, uh, discussions that I found was an, an NSC meeting the day after the Soviets crushed the rebellion. And Eisenhower, Dulles, Nixon, they're all sitting there, and Eisenhower says, yeah, I just got off the phone with uh, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, who was our ambassador to the United Nations. And, you know, Cabot said to, to me, why aren't we helping the Hungarians? You know, we, we promised we'd help them. We believe in liberation policy. And Eisenhower turned to everyone and said, how could he think that? <laughs> how could he, how could our U ambassador believe that? Well, if the our U ambassador believed that, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff 
which which said, you know, if we're going to if we're going to have liberation policy, why don't we back it up? Well, it's because of this this public rhetoric that they continue to use, and it was pretty amazing because there were a number of um, embassy people in Vienna and uh, Budapest who were saying, now is the time to act. The Hungarians are acting. We need to help them, and they were turned down. You know. Eisenhower and Dulles said, "No, we're not going to do this." But they were constant. All these, many of these these people were saying, "But that's not what you said. You've been constantly talking about liberation in just about every State of the Union address and all these speeches, constant commemorations of of uh, nationalist holidays in the Eastern European countries." So rhetoric was was having an effect. It was angering, you know. It was also angering the Soviets because the Soviets said, "Stop meddling in our, in our affairs." The Soviet Union certainly didn't back down from anything um, during this particular, during those first four, that first administration. They continued to try to sabotage the EDC. They certainly, you know, didn't weren't willing to give up their their hold on Eastern Europe. But the United States constantly said. At the last analysis, we are not going to go help them. And then the same thing happened with Berlin. Um, in June of 1958, a helicopter was shot down. American helicopter was shot down, and seven or eight crew members were taken prisoner. They were held by um, East German uh, personnel. The United States said, wait a minute. The Soviet Union is responsible because we don't recognize a separate East Germany. And the Soviets said, sorry, you need to go and deal with the East Germans. They're the ones who have custody of these seven, seven um, crew members. This had been happening for three or four years, minor incidents, um, inspections, stopping trucks on the, in the corridor, going to, east, going to and from East Berlin, uh, Berlin or East or West Berlin. East German officials were stopping American trucks, British trucks, uh, convoys, and constant appeals by the Allies to the Soviets were ignored. They said, sorry, you have to deal with the East Germans. This happened throughout the 50s. Um, at the same time, the United States is publicly, publicly pushing for the reunification of Germany. So their public posture was, we're not going to deal with East Germany because they don't, they don't represent a, a sovereign state. There is only one Germany, and the German gov Germany must be reunited under free elections, under the democratic process, um, no matter what the Soviet Union says. This was their public posture. Secretly, throughout the entire time when these, things, these events were occurring, both Eisenhower and Dulles rejected any calls for military action to, say, to uh, intervene. Um, both men, actually, it was a, a good quote from uh, uh, Eisenhower. He said, um, "You know, we don't want to get us. We do. We do not want to get a stiff-necked attitude about this, since we had dealt with the Chinese communists at Geneva in 1954. Again, another country, another nation-state that the United States didn't officially recognize." I, Dulles said, "When you have people kidnapped, you deal with the kidnappers, i.e., the German, the East German functionaries." This was their secret policy. Of course, they clashed because the United States had said, no, we want to uni reunify Germany under Western auspices. And the Soviet Union had said, we, we refuse. We want a divided Germany for a number of reasons, including the fact that the, the Soviets had been attacked by the Germans, of course, 1941. The French were in favor of a divided Germany. The, uh, the British were, the Belgians. And ultimately, in the secret uh, documents, the administration was in favor of a divided Germany. But it couldn't get out of this box that it was in. Uh, constant desire to prove its, you know, its anti-communist bona fides um, ran against you know, a policy, a practical policy of recognizing the way things were. And what I found, again, throughout this whole period, <clears throat> was a recognition privately, secretly, that this was not working, but they couldn't get beyond it. They couldn't get beyond their public posture. 
um, as I mentioned before in that quote I meant I quote I quote I read about our public relations policy almost defies solution how do you gird the free world for a, a struggle against communism without appearing belligerent in an in a in a in a in an atmosphere where a miscalculation by one or the other could lead to a nuclear war who is going to be willing you know which country in Europe is going to be willing to be the testing ground for that because we know it's going to happen in you know the the fight's going to take place in western germany in all likelihood so what i found again was this inability to come to terms with the the effects of rhetoric on foreign policy and i'm done thank you thank, thank you well uh, uh <coughs> rich presentation that I think will stimulate a number of questions and, and comments <coughs> and of course uh, um, uh, also uh, uh, reverberations of uh, what the United States is, is facing today. Um, if I may just start off the discussion and um, uh, ask you in a, an entirely presentist uh, fashion, so what, what are the lessons you draw um, from your study for you know, current U.S. policy? <laughs> well, I, I, I think I'll go back to what I said first. I mean what you say, and if, if you don't mean it, it's, it's, it's amazing how um, rhetoric can backfire if, if you're not, if, if an administration, you know, whether it's the United States, Britain, or whoever, if you're not willing to back up your words with deeds. I'd, what I didn't get into in, in this discussion uh, was the reaction by uh, of so many uh, members of the, you know subordinate members of the administration, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were furious about the the uh, <coughs> proposed budget cuts in 1953. They said, "Wait a minute, we can't do this on the cheap." Well, we could be seeing that right now. You know, is there, there's an argument that could be made about um, capabilities versus um, versus what you want to accomplish. Uh, we had a number of diplomats in the 50s criticizing rh rhetorical diplomacy because what they said was it's, it's angering our allies. How do we keep a coalition together? How do we uh, manage our alliance if we can't keep our closest friends on the same page? I think that's a lesson that any president, any administration, probably has struggled with you know, before and since you know, when, when you have conflicting goals. Um, but I really believe that if, 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 a, if an administration is going to say something, um, it better be prepared, if not for a reaction, certainly criticism, if they don't follow up on those words. And I can go through a million examples if you wanted me to. But Okay, so why don't we open it up for discussion. Let me, however, quickly, just uh, <coughs> in, in this context, um, mention two recent publications by the project, uh, Charles Gatti's Failed Illusions, of course, on 1956, <coughs> and then uh, just out a working paper by Hungarian colleague, uh, Evolution and Revolution, Sino-Hungarian Relations and the 1956 Hungarian Revolution, also uh, downloadable uh, at no charge from our website um, for those who are viewing this on the World Wide Web. Um, a paper that's taking advantage of some new releases on the hung Hungary crisis in 56 from the newly opening uh, Chinese Foreign Ministry archives. But now on to questions and, and comments, and if you could please uh, wait for the microphone and identify yourself. Um, my name is Stephen Shore. I enjoyed your presentation, Thank but you. I felt you were a little bit too charitable in describing the motivation of Eisen the Eisenhower administration in terms of educating the American public, would it not be fairer to speak of more of pandering to it? Because the anti-communist feeling among the electorate more than once, for example, in 1950, and this conspiracy theory is more than once when Eisenhower was campaigning in the 1952 campaign, he heard George Marshall's patriotism attacked and kept silent. And so this the need to differentiate themselves from this uh, what Nixon called the um, actually since cowardly college of communist containment mm -hmm. with a at least a more rhetorically aggressive approach to pander to the 
anti-communism of the electorate, and also the the suppression of Hungary was did really destroy, in retrospect, the appeal of of, of communism in the in Western Europe. It, it, it dealt the communist parties a blow from which they never recovered, and it, it and whether it, the administration deliberately provoked a Soviet response with this hope of getting this outcome may be a little bit um, hard to 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 uh, accept, but nonetheless that was the consequence. And um, so uh, to what extent were, was the Eisenhower administration a captive of American political attitudes that were verently anti-communist at that time? I agree with you You're, that there certainly was no condemnation of, of uh, that wildly um, overblown rhetoric, especially not only Nixon, but especially McCarthy. I mean, it took Eisenhower until 1954 when the Army hearings occurred for him to finally say this was enough. I think there was a little of that in that. What I, what I found was that r throughout the documents, there was this belief by both men, but especially Eisenhower, that there was an, uh, there was an insufficient recognition of the so of the communist threat because uh, communism at least in American eyes was not a very well-known concept both both men believed that were the Soviets words Lenin's words Stalin's words should be taken seriously and they seemed there was a criticism of Truman uh, especially for not propagandizing enough even though it, as I, as I, I would, I got into much more of this in my book. There certainly was a coordinated effort starting in the late 40s to deal with propaganda. So at least from their perspective, they didn't believe that they were pandering. They were worried that there wasn't enough anti-communist sentiment. I know that sounds counterintuitive, especially when we look back at at the the, the Red Scare, but it seemed from certainly from the 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 EPC, the Educational Policies Commission. Their main fear, Conant and, and Eisenhower, Conant, of course, the then president of Harvard, was that American, the American public was not aware, was not willing to learn without a coordinated effort from above, from the government. And so, as I said, it started in the, you know, the, the, with this commission advising the State Department, among others, and uh, filtering down into the schools. I, I certainly believe that there is a component there but from what I read in the documents I looked at, it was the exact opposite. As far as Hungary, um, it's interesting because Dulles said after both the Czech and uh, in 53, after the Czech and German rebellions were squashed, he said this is a defeat for the Soviet Union and we should play it up as much as we can. Um, we, should, we should use propaganda, we should employ even more propaganda to continue um, fomenting a re rebellions or unrest, of course, short of provoking a war because they, he continued to fear reprisals. And the same thing happened in Hungary. I guess you can look at it in a, in a long-term perspective. Obviously, it hurt. But, you know, 12 years later, the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia, and they got away with it. It didn't really, you know, nothing really concrete occurred until the late 80s. If you want to, if you look at it from one perspective, there's certainly, um, I would argue that it certainly hurt them um, when, when in the late 80, mid to late 80s, when the Soviets could not, you know, couldn't keep the keep their empire afloat anymore. It it disappeared in two years, two or three years. Um, I guess it all depends on, you know, how you want to look at. It. I know it certainly looked as certainly all those. The inaction in those three particular events certainly appeared to be a defeat. Yes, yes sir. Um, <clears throat> would you mind waiting for the, yeah, for the microphone? Sure. Does that does that make sense? You see what I mean? The yeah, long term. My point was that the by 1968, communism as an idealistic appeal in the West had vanished, and the 68 uh, invasion was fairly nonviolent. Only a, a handful of Czechs were. Was not, whereas in '56 we can say we could say to the world, "See, this is the true face of communism." Okay. Yeah. 
Sir? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, I have a few comments that I'd like to get your observation on. Um, <clears throat> Identify yourself. Uh, yes, uh, Ellis Motter. I'm a former public policy scholar here, but my pertinence to this discussion is um, as a young soldier, I was on Eisenhower and Dulles's staff at the summit conference in Geneva mm -hmm. for the Big Four Summit and Foreign Ministers Conference in the summer and fall of 1955. <clears throat> and so, and I handled all the top secret documents and, and actually translated um, a key document that I assume you looked at. It's, uh, it was the East German uh, government's manifesto on reunification mm -hmm. that they submitted and, and I uh, had, had done the translation on that. But, so I had a few, uh, you know, observations from what I sure. saw at that time, and I'm curious if it was born born out in the totality of what you looked at. Uh, uh, first of all, um, in that East German manifesto, um, the East German uh, government said that the only way they would go into reunification would be if they could really essentially maintain a communist system, and of course that was ridiculous from our point of view. And so it was very clear uh, to uh, all the decision makers on our side that we couldn't get anywhere near reunification. Mm -hmm. So as early, you know, as as at that me those meetings in '55, when I saw everything that Eisenhower and Dulles, you know, saw even the eyes only things for the two of them, plus Charlie Wilson or something. Since I was handling it, I had the privilege of reading it all, and uh, so they they clearly knew at that time that reunification was, you know, was just something that was totally, uh, you know, unfeasible and, uh, and yet, you know, as you say in the rhetoric, uh, you know, kept uh, talking the way they did. Yeah, I agree. There's no question about it. They, the, the Geneva Conference was considered to be a success for the U.S., but they knew that their main, one of their main goals was to try to get the reunification and it, and it was simply just, was not going to happen. Yeah. Now, um, this other, uh, one little point that I think is so um, illuminating of the Eisenhower's um, point of view on running the whole government was, uh, you know, at the conference we had the British, French, Americans, and the Russians, and, um, uh, but the main topic of the conference was Germany. We didn't have a German interpreter at the conference. Uh, because Eisenhower's, uh, you know, frugality in running the government, they, they wanted to save money, <laughs> so we didn't have a German interpreter. And so what happened was when the East Germans sent in this, it was, uh, my recollection was about 20 pages, type pages of this manifesto, uh, our woman who translated Russian said she would do it, and so she ma did a translation, and the British delegation did a translation, and the two came out diametrically opposed in, in, in what they really purported to be. And as a brash young soldier, uh, I was standing there when they were all wondering what to do about this. I said, oh, I can do it. And so I wound up, you know, writing the final version of, of that thing. Uh, and, but, but I think it's instructive of how Eisenhower uh, effort to uh, cut back. I mean, it wasn't only on military stuff, it was on that. The, um, the second uh, uh, and point... Let me just interject that there was a huge disagreement among, by Charles Wilson and um, the Treasury Secretary about, you know, he said, they said, wait a minute, we have decided to cut back the defense budget, and now you're allowing the Joint Chiefs of Staff to, to put a roadblock in there? I mean, there was certainly that, too, there bet within the Cabinet. A, di a disagreement about what the what they had said publicly. What what is the real policy? Um, a second uh, point. Uh, I'm not sure if you um, uh, you know if this is borne out in the uh, <clears throat> in the literature, but um, uh, y you know at that conference I had the opportunity to talk to virtually all the State Department uh, people that were there, and there was no question that throughout the whole ranks of the U.S. State Department there was a pervasive pessimism uh, on the fundamental battle between uh, America and, and, this, and, and communism. And uh, there was a tremendous pessimism uh, among all these people believing that, oh, in the long run, communism is going to triumph. I mean, it would, I don't know if you've seen, you know, if that comes out in the literature anywhere, but it sure as hell 
uh, was was universal among State Department people. And if I could just interject one other thing there, which didn't come from that conference, but but Admiral uh, Zumwalt, um, uh, in his uh, book, and he told me personally, said that Henry Kissinger had said to him at one point that he assumed communism would triumph uh, and that uh, the best we could do was hold on as long as possible. Um, so, but, but, but in any event, that was a really the, the view of all the State Department people at that time, uh, which I thought was amazing. Uh, um, the, the only last point uh, I wanted to make, and I don't know if you've seen this either, um, you know, since I saw everything Dulles was saying and writing and talking about, um, and it was particularly uh, evident in a, a meeting he had with Franco when he went uh, to Spain during the conference and met with him. Um, he told Franco when they were discussing the whole global uh, situation, he told Franco, and I, I believe from everything else I heard there that uh, Dulles really believed this, he said, oh, he believed we were going to triumph over company, N not what, you know, the view I got from the staff. And he said the reason was is because Christianity will, will triumph over communism because they're evil and we're not. And he really had this religious fervor uh, that, uh, that he actually believed. Now, I don't know if you see if that comes across in the documents, but, but it sure as hell did in, the, uh, in all the private stuff I saw. The, the interesting thing is I, I didn't need to look at that whole um, the Calvinistic religious fervor because there was enough of it. Um, in just this, in just the normal speech, you know, the regular speeches that both he and Eisenhower made. One of the interesting things about what I what I've done in this is sort of get away from the notion that um, the old historiography was that um, Eisenhower was a sort of an amiable dunce who kind of wandered around, played golf, and that Dulles controlled everything. And then in the 80s, the literature said it was the exact opposite. And what I what I found was they were both, you know, they were simpatico. They were very much together on these issues. And um, as far as, I, I agree with you, there's no question that both said privately and secretly that in the end this was a long-term struggle. The problem that I found was that rhetoric implied, this rhetorical diplomacy that they continue to employ really implied immediacy, really said, you know, we have a few years to do this. When there were a number of instances in the, in the meetings, in the telephone conversations where they said, you know, we're going to win this thing. But there's no question that 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 um, atmosphere of pessimism also influenced them to continue to ratchet up the rhetoric. Thank you. Good. We have a couple more speakers. I, let me just say that um, I think we have to be very very careful and look at um, um, uh, you know the various cases and instances as as we. Um, um, you know, look at some of these uh, sweeping assumptions. I mean, I, uh, in '53, in in many ways, the initial response by the Eisenhower administration, at least that's how I always read it, was in fact rather cautious and careful, in part not to claim um, uh, uh, causality for um, for the uh, uprising um, and not to diminish the authenticity of um, uh, the uprising and, and the, the, the workers' uh, uh, rebellion in uh, East Germany. And it seemed to me that the, the issue was, was always um, treading this, um, as they put it in the, in the files, this fine line between encouraging open insurrection, which everybody knew and had just experienced, the Soviets would put down violently, violently and um, uh, uh, to no good purpose, and maintaining um, uh, what they called the maintaining the spirit of resistance behind the Iron Curtain, which was essential um, to uh, um, uh, to the people um, um, on the other side, uh, and essential to keeping um, the Soviet Union uh, off balance, the Soviet Union and its client states. And um, 55 too, I think you you want to look very careful at at the um, at the documents. Certainly, in mm, in the spring and summer of 1955, Dallas um, 
firmly believed that German unification was just around the corner. Um, so that the discrepancy, the gap between what he was saying and internally arguing, certainly arguing with one of the staunchest skeptics on that front, Konrad Adenauer, was actually that gap was much, much smaller than, uh, than it uh, was at other points and, and, and may seem in retrospect. So, um, but with that said, uh, Jerry Livingston had some, uh, some comments. Jerry, the only thing you cannot ask is me for further no, yeah, <laughs> um, I just got two questions. One, sure. uh, Christian could answer if you wanted to. Um, the first concerns the Stalin note, you know, 1952, uh, about German unification. Do you, does your research show uh, what is the reaction in the American government uh, was to that? And the second thing is somewhat of an extrapolation of this pandering point. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible that part, one of the reasons for the rhetoric uh, was an effort to attract ethnic votes in the United States, particularly in the upper Midwest. Uh, the German Americans, you know, had long thought we fought the wrong war, wrong mm -hmm. opponent from 1941 to 1945, and they were very strong supporters of McCarthy. Uh, was it was electoral considerations, uh, both with ethnics in places like Cleveland and. Uh, and elsewhere, uh, and in the upper Midwest with German Americans, did that play a role in the rhetoric you described? Um, I didn't talk about it a lot in my book, but there's no question that it did. There was um, the Polish vote in Chicago, in Illinois, especially on Stevenson's home turf, um, but Cleveland, um, Ohio, you know, entire state of Ohio, upper Midwest. There's no doubt about that. Um, it just wasn't. It didn't come out as much in what I and how I looked at this. Um, but it was certainly a consideration. There have been many scholars who've talked about that. Um, so I, I certainly would think that the more professional um, advisors on, on Eisenhower's campaign staff were certainly aware of that. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that there was an intersection between, between that and this whole notion of taking the offensive against the communists. And so the communists, so it, they sort of complemented each other. As far as the Stalin note, um, most of the scholarship I've read, especially um, Rolf Steininger, they they consider it a genuine offer, but they didn't. The uh, Americans didn't really believe it. Every what I found, um, th looking at I, what Eisenhower and Dulles, how they reacted, say to Stalin's death, and some of the entreaties from Khrushchev as well, is that it was just another ploy, and how they determined that was from their readings of Lenin and Stalin. Uh, any. Uh, any bureau, you know, any diplomatic entreaty that came from the communists, according to their own works, according to what Lenin said, was just another way to goad um, the West into complacency. Um, now, you know, it, it depends on how uh, how a policy ma maker reacts. I mean, I th there have been some books that I've read that are, that show that once you get into that mindset, you can't really do anything because you don't trust any, you know, any. Uh, comments or any proposals, but they certainly felt that communist ideology uh, demanded that anything could be used to trick the opponent. Yep. Yep. Michael Binder, U.S. Air Force. The Bay of Pigs operation was planned by Alan Dulles, the CIA, he being the brother of John Foster Dulles, but it wasn't ready to go by the time Eisenhower left office. If it had been, do you think that Eisenhower would have green-lighted it and would he have supported it more strongly than Kennedy did? Oh, good question. Um, I'm really not an expert on Cuba, but uh, everything I, the little that I've read on that, that Eisenhower, they informed Kennedy of what was going on and it was sort of a, a continuation of, of previous policy. As far as supporting it publicly, I don't know. I don't know if if, if I mean militarily. No, mi yeah, militarily. I doubt it, but I I just don't know. I don't know enough about his policy to, toward Cuba. Uh, I would say that just based on what I know about Europe, I would I would think that he would have considered it a uh, a risk. But you have to remember that you know we we did support covertly. Um, you know, in Guatemala and Iran, I don't know if an overt display of of air power or anything like that 
would have been approved by Eisenhower. I don't know. I got the impression that he also supported Kennedy's decision not to – he didn't criticize him at all when Kennedy decided to pull back. I, but I I really don't know. I, that if Does anyone else have a, a more expertise in that area than, I do, than, than me? I don't – I don't know what your impressions might be. Let's let's take a another question up, up front here. I think you had a John? question. John Carlin, uh, State Department History Office, or as our editor would like us to say, uh, Department of History Office of the Historian. <laughs> <laughs> now he left. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Chris, I thought you very skillfully laid out the uh, disconnect between rhetoric and reality. Uh, I, I thought you showed us the great difficulty they had of accommodating to these two things, that finally they couldn't, and that it was actually things remained out of balance. I wonder if you can't make a sort of a counter argument that it actually wasn't an act of unbalance, but a brilliant act of balancing. Mm -hmm. Because after all, the rhetoric continues throughout the Cold War, John mm -hmm. Kennedy's inaugural speech, speech, uh, Ronald Reagan's evil empire, the accommodation continues throughout. And maybe you could make an argument that over the years this came out to be a very brilliant piece of balancing, unbalancing, so we could win the war. I think it all depends on the way you look at it. I, I, in my that's research that's now on uh, Nixon, I've seen a very um, strong correlation between public rhetoric and uh, decision making. Uh, as far as the uh, opening to China is concerned, I mean, Nixon wrote that famous article in 1967 in the Foreign Affairs where he talked about how the United States needed to engage China, and he certainly believed that in all the documents that I've looked at, the declassified documents, that certainly comes out. Um, my opinion of Reagan is that he meant what he said, you know, with Star Wars, with SDI and others, the evil empire speech. <coughs> and, uh, I haven't seen the re obviously I can't tell from seeing I haven't seen the records yet the the um, the deliberations but I suspect that um, the whole goal was to bankrupt the Soviet Union and I think that came out um, I I don't know I mean my my opinion my feeling is with, at least with Eisenhower they realized the problems they were getting into and um, locked themselves up into a box where they couldn't get out. And so they essentially, the administration had to acquiesce to all these things that it claimed to not want to accept, you know, the division of Germany, um, the division of Europe, you know. Um, and to me, it just seemed like they knew what was going on and they were powerless to stop it. But they understood or they believed that they had to continue speaking publicly in order to keep, keep an informed public uh, behind them. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what – I'd love to, you know, research some of the other administrations and see if they felt that way as well. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Take repeats? What? I'm sorry? Take repeats? Um, sure. Brief ones, though. <laughs> okay. Michael Binder, Air Force. There were other – contradictory aspects of the Eisenhower administration, he was supposed to be very fearful of war, nuclear war, accidental war, and yet he presided over this tremendous expansion of the U.S. nuclear arsenal, the disbursement of weapons around the world, an increase in the types of weapons, many more environments, and they were dispersed without permissive action locks, so the safety measures were pretty non-existent. Mm. And so on the one hand, he's concerned about nuclear war. On the other hand, he directly, because of the Atomic Energy Act, the president has this power, is presiding over actions that would ensure a greater likelihood of accidental nuclear war. Yes, that's definitely an irony. Uh, I, I did a little of that in my research. And in fact, one of the one of the key pieces that I that I used as far as um, sort of, un maybe it was unconscious, but this this whole desire to give nu give peaceful nuclear um, power to West Germany, you know, that sort of belied the whole Adams for Peace program, the whole um, notion that um, arms should not be, or you know, nuclear weapons should not be um, proliferated throughout the, the world. There's no question about that. And I mean, there are some things <laughs> I was just discussing this with one of my colleagues. There are 
some internal documents where Eisenhower is absolutely wholly opposed to any use of nuclear weapons, and yet there are others where he considers it in certain instances. And, he, and the evidence is in, in 1954, we refused to use, um, not only to intervene, but also to refuse to use nuclear weapons in, in, uh, at Dien Bien Phu after that occurred in 1954 in Vietnam. So it all depends on the focus of the documents. I would suspect it was the, the, the former that you mentioned that he did not, he certainly feared them. But the whole bigger bang for the buck thing was a big consideration. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chris, for um, a stimulating presentation. Congratulations on your new book, The Truth is Our Weapon. The Rhetorical Diplomacy of Dwight D. Eisenhower and John Foster Dallas. A round of applause for Chris, and thank you for coming. Thank you all very much. And please join us on the 28th for At the Dawn of the Cold War. Thank you. Thanks once again. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Um, get to, uh, okay, get to know us. Oh, absolutely. I wish that there was. Yeah, I know. It's too much effort. Um, yeah, let's see if we can get something up on the website.